my husband was dealing cocaine and using cocaine. And I would find bags of cocaine in his closet, in his drawers. And I was totally against drugs. And I would just dump everything in the toilet, thousands of dollars of cocaine in the toilet. And it was something that didn't belong to him or he was selling for somebody else. And anytime I looked, I found it and I made sure I got rid of it. Yeah, I think <laughs> Frank was, he was gone for a weekend or he was, he didn't come home one night. So I packed all his stuff and put it on the front <laughs> steps. And when his friend went to drop him off, he goes, is that a suitcase? And Frank is like, yeah, keep going. Welcome all you wiretappers. Good to have you back here in the studio. And, and as you can see, if you're on YouTube, I have two special guests. Now, one of them, you guys all know, Cam Camillus Robinson, and the other you may not know, but you may know something about her ex-husband, Frank Calabrese Jr., and her name is Lisa Swan. And Lisa and my friend Cam have partnered up to write a book about her life with the mob. I believe it's called Married with the Mob. What's the name of it? Chicago Swan Song, a, uh, a Mob Wife Story. Been through a couple iterations of the title, but but that one really sort of summed up Lisa's story. Chicago Swan Song, a mob wife story. Okay, great. Well, welcome, Lisa. They're really ha- anxious to get your story. Thanks, Gary. How did you guys first get together? Uh, me and Cam or me and Frank? Yeah. Well, you and Cam first. How, how did you hook <laughs> up with Cam? So uh, my ex-husband and I are very, very close. We're best friends. Um, and he suggested that I do a... Uh, do an interview with the guys. And mm-hmm. uh, I had a lot of fun. It was very cathartic to talk about stuff and yeah. throw in a little humor. And then I talked to Cam because he wanted to do another spot. And I said, hey, can we can we write a book? Can we do something with this and go bigger? And he's like, I, I was going to ask you the same question. Cool. So the rest was history. And history, yeah. I did a lot of Zoom calls from where I worked because I work a lot. And uh, we we plugged through and got it done. Again, the second question would be, you and Frank Calabrese Jr., how did you guys get together? Did you guys go to high school together? Were you high school sweethearts or were you older? No, we lived in the neighborhoods next to each other. So I was in Galewood where all the city workers lived. Mm-hmm. He was in Elmwood Park. And we all used to go to uh, a place in Elmwood Park called Eric and Me. That's where everybody met before we all went out to the bars and the nightclubs. And that's where I had uh, seen him. And I'm like, oh, my God, he's so cute. And, you know, know, uh, I remember one of my friends sitting next to me. She's like, forget about it. She goes, you don't know that family and his father. And I'm like, well, how bad could it be? You know, (laughs) famous last words and uh and so then one of my friends uh introduced me to him things didn't really click and then one night I was downtown uh, she called him and said hey why don't you come down and meet us and I didn't know she was doing that and then he walks in and I'm like what the hell is happening (laughs) and she goes oh I gotta go now so Frank could drive you home and then from there the rest is history uh, it just took off. So I, I guess since this is kind of story of your marriage, but the outfit, the Chicago outfit and the Calabrese's are almost synonymous. And now, did you have any idea what that meant? The the Chicago outfit when you first met? Oh, him? yeah. Oh, yeah. Because I was surrounded by all of that. And when somebody would, you know, get killed or something, my grandfather would say, hey, let's go walk down there because all the news Uh, vans would be there and everything. And so I knew what a bookie was. I knew what a loan shark was. I knew that was normal. That was normal in my neighborhood. When it came to Frank Sr., I just thought he was another loan shark. You know, I I didn't know to what level he was involved in. I think that's an important distinction is, you know, when you're, when you're in the neighborhood, when you're surrounded by Italians and in that little enclave, it's like, you know, you know, Gary, from, I mean, the bookie's on every corner. So, I mean, if, if you're dating the son of the local bookie, I mean, eh, you know, it, that's not that big a deal, you know, in the neighborhood. You know, it was very you know normalized. The, yeah. If you don't know the full, full story. The, a good word, at least it was normalized in, in your mm-hmm. life, whereas in somebody yeah. else's life, it was not normalized. Yeah. And, yeah. And you're relationship progressed you know you got married did you have a big 
traditional Italian wedding? Did they bring all kinds of envelopes to you? Was it like the Godfather? And, and, uh, there were a lot of envelopes. Um, I think there was a lot of envelopes I didn't even see. I wanted a wedding in Wheaton at Donata House. I wanted it to be outdoors. I wanted, I didn't want the traditional Italian wedding, but all of that just got messed up and it was getting too crazy. And then I had it at Al's and Cicero. So I did have the Italian wedding. We cut down the list to, I want to say, cut it down to 300. <laughs> Mind you, my family was at one table. Because I come from a very small family. Oh, you guys were like overwhelmed by. Yeah. So it was mostly, you know, Frank's family, Frank's dad's friends. And yeah, yeah, it was uh, it was pretty intriguing, to say the least. I can imagine. I can only imagine. Yeah. Who's who of the outfit were probably there. Were the cops out front right down license plates? The FBI. Pictures? I mean, that was the most secure parking lot probably ever. <laughs> That's what I figured. <laughs> Don't have to worry about your car getting stolen. Everything's cool. <laughs> what What was he doing for a living at the time? Did he have like a square John job that he went into every day? He worked for the city. I use that loosely. Loosely. Because... And, no, and the kind of a no-show job for the city. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It, I mean, I know at one point, Frankie was really, he was into his job. He showed up for his job. He used to like to play hockey on Sunday nights. He was very active, but his father just took over and was like, well, you need to do this for me and this and that. And, you know, Frankie pretty much gave up on everything. Except for doing what his father wanted. Is that? Yeah. I mean, they're just, and, you know, uh, I know a lot of people say, oh, well, couldn't he just say no? No, you couldn't. Yeah. His father was just, everyone was under his thumb and just you know you couldn't say no Giant, did you guys dark live, shadow that moved over everything yeah. did you guys live no. separate from the family and or in the same neighborhood it seemed like he had a big house with uh like a well, his brother lived upstairs or something didn't he well in the compound they called it yeah. i think it was on 74th avenue in grand yeah so that's where when i first met frankie that's where they were all living but not senior he was in oakbrook no oh, okay with diane no, we lived separately from them. And, you know, I tried to get further. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but it, it just doesn't always work. When, when I followed mob guys around, it seemed like a lot of them, they, uh, they got up late and, and they left for work, so to speak. And it'd be sometimes noon, sometimes two or three in the afternoon. And then they'd be out till midnight, one, two o'clock in the morning. Was that, was Frank, did he have like a normal daytime business hours or did he do that a lot of as time? far as i know he did i always worked and i worked down at the Merck, so i was there early yeah so after i left the house and you know there was no cell phones back then so i really don't you know i have no idea um i do know that when we first started dating i usually didn't see frankie till about 10 at night and i'm like but what are you doing and he's like nothing don't worry about it and then one night I remember I didn't hear from him and I'm like, oh my God. And this is, you know, we were hot and heavy dating. And I said, well, I'm just worried about you. He goes, well, if I drop the pencil on my foot wrong, that that's what's wrong. So, which meant that he was counting stuff for, for his father. Uh, I see. Yeah. And I was like, okay. And I, I was the kind that didn't badger. I didn't ask. Yeah. I didn't want, I didn't want to know anything. So as which, long as he provided a good living, then. It was okay, and he didn't bring any of the violence. Uh, in yeah, that. no, I didn't know. Uh, when we first got married, I didn't know that he partied. I didn't know how in depth his, you know, father was involved, or that he was a murderer. I mean, I had a murderer at my table. On the Sopranos, you see the 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 big family Sunday dinners with the uh, baked yeah. ziti and and that kind of a thing, and all everybody around the table. And then, and Tony was this dad that, you know, that did stuff, talked to his kids and did things. And, and then he had this other, he had this, that's one thing that's fascinating to me. And I think to a lot of people is that these two separate lives of, you know, of dual personality, yeah, du dual personalities, how they keep that yeah. one part of their life so secret. And it was so yeah. different and separate from their family life. So did you, when did you start seeing through that, that this is, 
you know, is it, when did he start bringing that home? Was it because of cocaine? Um, so when I found out that he partied, that just shattered me when we had our daughter, Kelly, uh, it was right after then where I started finding, you know, the short straws or the twenties rolled up. And I'm like, what is this? I mean, I just oblivious. Yeah. And I'm like, what is happening? And so when Frankie partied, that was like his normal. So I met him at his normal. Uh-huh. So I didn't know any different. And then once his dad was really, really coming down on him, Frankie just kind of, you know, he, he changed. He just, you know, he had no drive to do anything. It was just so beat down. And I guess his dad was still active in whatever he was doing. And he relied a lot on Frankie. Uh So here Frankie wanted to get out of that when he got married and had kids and his dad was just like with the claw, just pulling him right back in and like, you know, no. So I almost felt like Frank's dad was jealous of me and my daughter, Kelly, because Frankie wanted to be with us and not him. And he just wouldn't allow that. You just couldn't escape it. He didn't deal drugs. He got plenty of money from his dad by when he was. Well, he, he was dealing. Oh, he was he dealing was, too. He was doing it and dealing. Um, that, that's why when I would, you know, find stuff in the house, I would flush it. I'm like, nope. You know, I just, there's just some things I wouldn't tolerate. That was one of them. Senior is not overly generous with his, uh, with, uh, with, with paying, uh, paying his, his children. It wasn't <laughs> no. like they were making a ton of money off the Calabrese crew. Yeah, no. No, he was, he was not, uh, everything had, uh, strings attached. So like when we, we moved to Elmhurst, that was like a big move for Frankie. Cause he's always in Elmwood park. So when we moved to Elmhurst, that was one of Frank senior's houses that he owned. Uh. We lived there. Um, it was okay. And we had a first birthday party for Kelly we had it at, I can't remember the name of the restaurant. It was like close to downtown Chicago. And we had a first big blowout for Kelly. Frank's dad was there and he ordered special food. He got special wine. And then he got mad at Frankie and called him, oh, you think you're a big fucking big shot? And then he raised our rent. Frank Sr. would always hurt you in the pocket. Any job that Frankie would do or he'd start a side business, Frank Sr. would always stick his nose in there and want to get a cut of it instead of, you know, inspiring your sons and saying, Hey, let me help you get this off the ground. No, he wanted a piece of it. And then he ruined everything. So he, he treated him just like he was a member of his crew. Like he was some correct smuck out yeah. there that wanted to be, yeah. you know, a made guy or something. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. Was there ever- and I remember Frankie telling me the story of when he robbed a house when he was young and he went to go hide the stuff somewhere in the compound. I don't know if it was in a washer or a dryer that wasn't working. He found some of Frank Sr. stuff in there. <laughs> I think that's how the story went. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was like, oh boy. <laughs> Apple doesn't fall too far. Far from the tree. <laughs> yeah. So I guess what about the the his uncle Nick Calabrese? He was uh, he seemed like he was a stone killer just as much as his dad. He didn't seem quite as mean and controlling and everything. Just a little bit I've read about him, but was he around very much? Was, was he? Was he Frank was not around him? very much. Um, uncle Nick, I always thought he was a nice guy, very quiet, very much to himself. I know he was close with uh, Frank Jr. and Kurt when they were growing up. Man of few words. Okay. You know, he was nice. His family was nice. But, you know, when I first got in the family, I thought, you know, because I came from such a small, quiet, white collar family. (laughs) You know, I meet this family and there's big dinners and all this stuff. And, you know, I just realized everybody didn't like each other. They tolerated and they just um, basically paid homage to Frank Sr. out of respect because they had to. So the the hierarchy of the outfit in Chicago, did did you start getting a 
a sense of where the Calabrese family fit into that hierarchy? No. Got the Ayupa was the boss, and Sarone may have been nope. the underboss. Yeah, okay. You I had no clue about that. Okay, I was interested. I had no clue about any of that. So Frankie really never talked to me about anything. I remember when we were dating, and I'm like, you know, when am I going to see you? When his dad would go to Florida, Frankie would have me in the car waiting while he went in to pick up an envelope. So, you know, that's how I spent time with <laughs> Frank Jr. Right around um, collection for a, a yeah, loan shop. and I really, I really didn't ask. I really didn't want to know. I just, I just wanted to be married. I just wanted to, you know, find my happily ever after. And that stuff, I was just like, all right, you you do you. I'll just, you know, I'll be here, you know. And that didn't work out so well. Yeah. Until there came a time when uh, uh, I, I guessed it his, was his drug use just getting so bad that it was affected the marriage that he wasn't home. And when he was, he was out of it. How, how did that? Well, I know for fact that Frankie used cocaine to escape his father. So that was like his grand vacation. He would just, putting up with senior was not easy. You know, I would see Frankie come home and he'd have, you know, a red cheek from getting hit or whatever. Uh, Frank Sr. hit my husband in front of my daughter one day at the house. And when I came home, and I wasn't there for it, I came home. I think Sophie was there. That was Frank Sr.'s mom. And she just looked at me and rolled her eyes. I'm like, "Uh (laughs) uh-oh, something's up because I saw Frank Sr.'s truck in front of my house. And usually that's when I would keep going if I saw that truck, because I didn't want to see him. Frank just, he got really bad uh, using to escape his father. And then after Frankie took the money from his dad, it just, it just, it, it went downhill so quickly. He wanted to do good things with the money Mm -hmm. and open businesses and try and make money and say, here, dad, this is what I did. That just, that all fell apart. So he was continually trying to get his father's approval and his father continually withheld his approval. Beat him down. Yep. Okay. Yeah. They both ended up going to the penitentiary. Were you still with Frank Jr. then? So I tried to divorce Frankie before he left um, and he just wouldn't, wouldn't do it. So I had to wait till he went away before about a year before he left uh we were sleeping in separate bedrooms his cocaine use was really bad a couple times i thought he was dead you know because he would be pasty white and motionless on the couch is he breathing you know i just i didn't know what to expect um and i basically focused on the kids and just to keep going i watched somebody that i was in love with and i also hated him at the same time that's uh that's really hard a pretty common response for uh, somebody that's married to an addict like that is that you got to yeah. figure out a way to deal with it. And, and oh my that's, gosh, that, that's one way to deal with it is to kind of just zone out from it. And so I, I oh, I was yeah. a zombie, emotional yeah. zombie for sure. Did was there? Of course, there was no question. There was not going to be any kind of marriage counseling. I don't think in, in this deal was there. No, and that. I think I suggested that, but. It just, it was too far gone. And, you know, with him having to turn himself in soon, he was just on a spiral, you know, and I couldn't talk to anybody about anything. Yeah. Because that means I'm involving people and no one wants to be involved in any of that. So and people were generally just scared to, to to talk to anybody inside that family to begin with, or they, I mean, so yeah. you, you were isolated because of that. You were isolated because the family didn't want you to talk to anybody. You're yeah. isolated in, in, in your marriage. I mean, it was really, really rough times. It was pretty shitty. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> <laughs> and especially when uh, Frank's, uh, Frank Sr. had to sit down with me in the basement. You know, that kind of put a l- little bit of fear in me. Yeah, Lisa's been to a mob sit down. I can only, yeah. I can only imagine, Lisa. I, I would imagine that you probably... Uh, uh, tell about that in your book in, in much more detail. We don't want to give away everything in the book, but that sounds like a pretty interesting. <laughs> yeah, that was uh, that was read. pretty crazy it's about Lisa Swan and her sitting down mob sitting down. Yeah, Frank Calabrese Senior. There's many a man that didn't really come out of a sit down like that <laughs> in one piece. <laughs> yeah, and, and I didn't know how to shut up either. I'm like, Uh-oh. what are you talking about? 
Uh oh. <laughs> yeah. What do I know? <laughs> I well, didn't list off about five guys who didn't walk out of the ring. At least it did. <laughs> really. It's, uh, you know, this is quite a slice of life that uh, has never really been told before from, from your angle. I'm, I'm really yeah. happy to, uh, to read this book and, and take a look at it and, and maybe uh, do some more uh, little stories out of it uh, as we go along. It's, uh, I'm trying to think is, uh, what, what's that like for you when he's going to trial? You know he's going to trial. I don't, were there headlines about this trial? Did your neighbors and everybody know about it, your friends? Well, yeah. So when they all got picked up, that was like the big news when we lived in Chicago. So we moved to Phoenix in 2002. So the trial, I believe, was in 06 or 07. We were already in Phoenix, but still, there's so many Chicago people out here. I mean, I was working at Mercedes Benz. There was a guy walking with Frank's uh, book that he yeah. wrote, <laughs> and I didn't know this guy. I didn't know this customer, and I said, "Oh, are you liking that book?" He goes, "Yeah." He's like, "Holy cow!" I said, "Well, guess what? I'm Lisa Slan, the ex-wife that that's in there." <laughs> <laughs> He just looked at me like I had two heads. I'm like, see ya. I can only imagine. <laughs> yeah. And that happened again. I was in a restaurant out here, Italian restaurant. They had the best bolognese. I was with someone that I was dating. And the table behind us had the book on the table, Frank's book. The guy, Joe, I was dating at the time, you know, said hi to the guy. I don't know how we even saw the book or whatever. And I and I turned around, I go, hi, I wrote two chapters in that book. I'm Lisa Swan. And they're like, what? It was so funny. <laughs> Joe was mortified. I can imagine. <laughs> yeah, he's like, you got to talk about that? <laughs> yeah, so never a dull moment. Never. Really. <laughs> now, I never guess when, when, when Frank started wearing a wire on his dad in prison and, and started Dealing with the FBI, you were totally out of the picture by then. You, 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 uh, you well, we were that? still we were still talking, but he did not utter a word about right. any of that. Nothing. I had no clue until all this came out. Out, I had no idea that my father in law was a murderer. I had no. I did not know. I knew he had a temper. Yeah. But I didn't know, you know, what he was capable of. And Uncle Nick, I was I was like, holy shit, these people were at my house with my kids. Yeah, I can imagine by the time that was that about the family secrets trial came out. That you know. <laughs> Yeah, that was that was a lot before mm -hmm. uh, the trial. I asked the FBI if we could move Frank out of where we were living just because the stress was so much. We also owned a pizza place in North Scottsdale, which was a pickup and delivery. And, and um, I had all the young neighborhood kids working for us. I remember seeing a car facing the pizza place. So it was a private investigator that Frank Sr. hired. I was getting migraines because of the stress, because of the trial coming up, because of the business and all these innocent young kids, you know, working for us my kids included, and I'd have to lay down on the cement floor and put ice on my head. And I told Frank, I said, I can't do this anymore. So we closed up shop, sold everything, pennies on the dollar. Then he testified. Mm -hmm. and, but he yeah. never went into witness protection, I don't believe, and changed his name. No, he never did. Precaut precautions did he take? Basically, it was all his father's words that got everyone in trouble. It wasn't anything Frankie said. And I think it's pretty crazy that because Frank Sr. was always tight lipped about everything as far as I would hear. And I just think it's nuts that Frank Sr. was talking about all that. You know, there was a lot of stuff that Frankie didn't know that he learned. So it's how the universe works, I guess. Really. And for you guys that don't quite understand that, when Frank Calabrese Jr. and his dad were in the penitentiary, Frank Jr. was wearing a wire and his dad started bragging about a lot of the murders, yeah. a lot of the things that he did for the outfit. And that that basically it's crazy. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. 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 It's very it's it's that's uh, uh 
it was kind of unbelievable that it happened that way. And if Frank Sr. would have got out, my husband and Kurt, Kurt really wasn't, I don't know how much he was involved, but Frankie was more, you know, his father's number one. One of them was going to end up dead. That's for sure. If everyone was out at the same time, because when Frankie got out, Frank Sr. was still giving him stuff to do. Uh I I knew that was part of his deal was he did not, he was tired of his father sucking him back in and he he knew the only way he could get out was to do what he did was to wear the wire. That was the only way. That's what he said. And and I've read that. Yeah. Yeah. It was, uh, I will not repeat the conversations, but I heard some of the conversations and I'm like, you can't do that. (laughs) You can't do that. That family, I mean, if the boys could have gone to college, Frank Sr. wouldn't let them go. They could have been really successful, like all their friends. You know, they all had the chance to go to college and, you know, do something and not be, you know, caught up in all of that. Yeah. You know, that was Sr.'s reign and he just, he was a control. Everything was control. Well, Lisa Swan and Camillus Robinson, I really appreciate you guys coming on the show and and telling about your upcoming book, which you don't have a copy of it there yet. I understand you guys on YouTube. You'll you'll see a picture. Right, right. I'll we'll we'll post the co- we'll post the cover. Re- remind us all of the title of it. Uh, Chicago Swan Song, a mob a mob wife story. Chicago, Chicago Swan Song, a mob wife story. Chicago Swan Song, a Bob Wife story. Okay, cool name. Yep. Lisa Swan. Lisa Swan, I really appreciate you coming on. And, uh, you know, I, I have talked with your uh, ex husband, and he's a nice guy. And he said the same about you. I told him <laughs> that I was going to be talking with you and Cam today. He goes, Oh, Gary Jenkins, he's a nice yeah. guy. <laughs> One of these days, I'm going to have to go to Chicago. Does he still run the tour? Yeah. Yeah, he was doing the tours through Christmas and, you know, people can't get enough. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Plus, he's a personable guy. So, yeah. Well, guys, I, I really thought that story was interesting and, and I hope you will, too. I know you will. Uh, don't forget, I like to ride motorcycles. So when you're out there on the roads, look out for motorcycles. And if you have a problem or a friend that has a problem with PTSD and they've been in the service, be sure and tell them or yourself. If you've got the problem, go to the VA website and get that hotline number for help with uh, for PTSD. Thanks a lot, guys. Thanks a lot, Lisa and Camillus. Thanks, Gary. <laughs> Absolutely. 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 Absolutely.